Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks and praise for your just judgment, but also and especially for your grace and mercy you have shown to us by bearing our sin and punishment, and giving us uh, righteousness, holiness, and eternal life. We pray that you, who are the true book of life, would always keep and guard our names written in you, calling us to repentance if we fall away, and so guard us into life eternal, so that when the day of your return comes, we will welcome you as our friend. This we pray, Jesus Christ, in your holy name. Amen. Alright, so we are turning to the second last session of this lecture series. After this we will be going into uh, questions of, of heaven and, and the finale of Revelation, but before that the great turning point is upon us today in the chapters 19 and 20, which kind of draws together in some sense everything that has been coming this far and leads the reader already. This is the, the nexus, this is the turning point, the great uh, climax of, of Revelation. And then we come to the, uh, after this, next week we come to the uh, grand final vision of future glory of the church. And and the bliss of heaven. <clears throat> if you want, you can turn to your Revelation 19. I think we'll probably, this kind of forms two parts. We'll read the, the chapter 19 and go through that, and then, then um, check the second, uh, the 20th chapter afterwards. So chapter 19. After this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just, for he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality, and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waves, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage, marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is, linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it, called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. 
and the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burned with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. All right, quite, quite gory vision. So it begins, the chapter 19 begins in jubilant moods. We are drawing actually from the, or drawing to a close the fall of Babylon described in the chapter 17 and 18. So this uh, loud voice forms, uh, uh, crying out hallelujah and then triumphant uh, cries from heaven makes a strong contrast with the wailing and, and sadness in previous chapter. Mourning is now changed into rejoicing when the viewpoint moves away from the merchants of this world into God's church. So what was a great tragedy and a shocking downfall of Babylon is now a source of joy for these, these voices. The shout hallelujah is common in the liturgy of the church, but actually in Bible doesn't show up so often as you'd think. It exists in this form only in two books, Psalms and Revelation. Hallelujah is an exhortation, let us praise, followed by Jah, the name of God. So hallelujah is translated praise the Lord as a sort of a exhortation, let us praise the Lord. And that's the correct translation. Psalms show this praise and exhortation to praise together with God's righteous judgment, for example, Psalms 104, 149, but also concerning His grace and kindness. Hallelujah leads the church to praise God who reveals Himself to His people and resides with them. So it's, the book of Psalms gives many occasions for shouts of hallelujah, or let us praise the Lord. Sometimes uh, when his judgment is revealed, sometimes when his fatherly kindness is revealed, all the times when his presence with his church is made known. Revelation has shown, of course, already many cases where the heavenly uh, host and the church praises God uh, through songs and, and such, but this triumphant shout of hallelujah is actually sounded first time in Revelation when the depictions of the last judgment start to roll in. So it's, it's like they have reserved the greatest triumph and the greatest shout of, of rejoicement to this point. And I think this is again directing the reader into how uh, we should dispose ourselves to these events. These are not, at least they are not meant to be, frightening or despairing trials. But rather, what, what the heavenly host sees is the outbreak of God's saving power, revelation of his kingdom, and the moment of liberation for his children. The last day is a day of joy for Christians, and is drawing forth their praise to the heavenly majesty. And last time we discussed a little bit about uh, how can we rejoice, for example, when we read this. Uh, this, uh, visions of destruction given to the great Babylon. Um, and I think we come back to that towards the end of this, end of this lesson. But that's maybe suffice to say for this point, that simply Revelation seems to be directing our reading and our experience with our reading, with a very clear message, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. This is a happy thing. This is a joyful thing you Christians are seeing that something which is bad and which has been opposing God has now been taken away. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. So, all are invited 
to join this praise, all you his servants, both great and small. This figure of speech, both great and small, has shown before when it comes to judgment in both chapter 6 and, and then later on in this, uh, this reading in, in 20. But it's also speaking about the rejoicement that all, both great and small, who are in God's kingdom will now rejoice. So there is a certain universality, uh, both with judgment and both with rejoicing and, and liberation, that they go through all the levels of society or grandness. All kinds of people are either judged or rejoiced. The terms used by John to describe what kind of voice of praise he hears, this are familiar from elsewhere in the Revelation. Now we start to get, we're at that point of, of the book where we start getting these references to earlier chapters. And those are interesting as well, not just to, to Old Testament references, but also references to what has been said in, in Revelation. Uh, roar of rushing waters, peals of thunder have been already mentioned quite many times. And these sounds are first heard as descriptions of God's speaking. How Jesus' voice is like roar of waters and from God's throne came the peals of thunder. And only once they are shown in that sense, they are then later applied to God's people. So we can see that God not only gives uh, his people the cause for rejoicing, but even the voice with which they sing his praise. What we first hear in his word is then echoed in our praise. His word is, uh, or his speaking is the sound of, of waters and peal of thunder. And after that, our rejoicement and our praise becomes also sound of, of many waters and peals of thunder. It's good to note that uh, the rushing waters and peal of, peals of thunder are used to describe the voice of the church militant on the Mount Zion in chapter 14. If you remember, that's the, one of those intermissions between visions where we saw Lamb standing with his church on Mount Zion, and they were uh, rejoicing and singing, and their voice was like rush of many waters and, and peals of thunder. So now you can say uh, what we hear in chapter 19, praising God, is the same, or you know, it includes the church militant in chapter 14, which was standing there meeting the foes on the field. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, <coughs> and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Now we've seen already before in Revelation a few instances where God's church is compared to a woman. Uh, in, in Revelation 12, we see the faithful woman with the sun around her head and, and stars and moon. Uh, and that's drawing from the Old Testament background, where Yahweh, the God of Israel, Lord Sebaoth, has uh, a wife of, of nation of Israel, who then turns out to be unfaithful. But that imagery of, of a husband and wife, or a bridegroom and a bride, is very strong, and it now reaches culmination. Already Paul noted in 2 Corinthians 11 that the church is betrothed to Christ. So engaged, promised for marriage. Now engagement period draws to an end and the wedding celebration is at hand in this chapter. Now the marriage of the Lamb has come. The verse 8 describes the true beauty of God's church. It's like any other bride, she wants to be beautiful on her wedding day. And, and how is she made beautiful? She is clothed with fine linen, bright and pure, and it's explained, the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Now, what does it mean that the church is decorated with righteous 
deeds of the saints. What are righteous deeds? Uh, the Greek word used here, dikaioma, does not mean, let's say, it does not mean exactly, or it means also, let's say that, but not only, the same as good works. But rather it means works that receive approval by God. And that has to do with how, how Greek word dikao, to justify, actually works and what does it mean. It's like a language family, you know, you can draw from that verb multiple other words then. Uh, so these are just works or, or righteous works, which is drawn from the verb to justify. And, and dikao, to justify, is a verb, it's a courtroom verb, if you could use it, call it like that, Don. Uh, it's, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a word which does not primarily describe uh, moral, moral or qualitative goodness of things, but rather their legal standing. So therefore, to justify in scriptural language, to dikao, to, to justify, means to pronounce not guilty. That's what the word means in secular use also. That's how the Greeks would understand it. So, obviously, uh, if, we, if we see that they are clothed, that the bride is clothed with uh, just or righteous works, these works are good works. But there is more to it than that. It means that these are works with God which God has taken pleasure in, that please God, that he gives his approval to these works. They are uh, declared righteous works by him who approves them. So the one who is clothed in Christ, the question is where do we receive these good works? We receive them from Christ. The one who is clothed in Christ, both as an individual and especially as a church, receives not only the full pardon of their sins, but also the entire obedience and holiness of God's own Son. 1 Corinthians 1.30 states that Christ has been given to us to be our righteousness, but also holiness. The ever-important sola gratia, by grace alone, that Lutherans like to say, does not mean only forgiveness of crimes or, or the fact that God blots out our sins. It certainly means that, but it also means a fulfillment of God's requirement of what you ought to do. You could say that the forgiveness sort of says it takes away what bad you have done, but still then there remains the question of, well, have you done anything good? It's, it brings you to zero. Well. But the gospel of Christ is so rich that it does not simply uh, stop at saying that your, your punishment has been taken away, but actually it fills the church and the believer with all the holiness of Christ. So that not only are you, uh, you know, made right with God again, but rather you are adorned and, and decorated with all the holiness God's own Son, that it becomes your holiness as well. Christ really is given to us to be our holiness. So therefore Christians who are in Christ are clothed and decorated with the goodness and righteousness of Christ. Thus this chapter uh, fits well with Ephesians 5, where also we hear about relationship between God and his church through marriage terms. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So you see, both aspects are there in Ephesians 5. It's without blemish and in splendor, that the Bride of Christ is forgiven and uh, made splendid and beautiful and radiant by the holiness of, of God, given, of course, in Ephesians 5, it's, it's, it's 
connected with baptism and just generally God's grace given to us that he clothes, clothes us with the righteousness of Christ. Then in the ninth, ninth verse, the angel says, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it's actually kind of interesting that, that there is this command, write this, as if uh, John wouldn't be writing all of this down anyways. But maybe it's almost like the, the, the angel is underlining that this is really important. You really have to take care to record this. Uh, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, I don't know, no, <laughs> we have Worship 101, so we could maybe <laughs> check from there. Uh, in some Lutheran churches, uh, and probably not other churches as well, it's, it's common that when the communion begins, the pastor invites uh, the congregation by saying these very same words, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb, come all is prepared. That's how I usually started communion back home. So it's it's kind of giving a statement about what kind of marriage marriage feast is this and also what is going on in the church. That already now the church is t having, we could maybe say, foretaste of that great feast. In the sense that, sure enough, on the last day there will be much more. But already now we are starting the feast. And in, in settings one and two we have, this is the feast. Right, right, this is the feast of the victory of our God. Certainly there is that idea then. then and saying that this is the feast, it's, it's, it's saying that it's not just something which happens at the very end of ages, maybe still who knows how long in the future, but already now you are celebrating that, that's true. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. Oh, how human. <laughs> but he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The finishing sentence is a good summary of the right way to read, not only revelations, but the entire scripture. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of it all. Um, meaning, um, or, or that the, the testimony of Jesus is the meaning which makes everything live, live, and come together in the scripture. That the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So it's like Luther said, that everything in scripture is driving Christ or promoting Christ. That indeed, if you have reading of scripture which does not have testimony of Jesus, then you have scripture without spirit and you are reading it wrong. But when you do have the testimony of Jesus and when you find Jesus in the scriptures, then you have discovered the spirit of prophecy. At the same time, you could say it is not only a, a way of, of, of guiding you how you should read scripture, but it's also telling you how you worship God. The angel gives this rebuking command, don't worship me, worship God. And then God is being worshipped properly when the testimony of Jesus is kept and proclaimed. Only through Christ's testimony, through worship and praise of God becomes possible and it is in keeping Christ's testimony and proclaiming that, that God is truly worshipped. All right, well, then now we have these rejoicing visions of, of marriage feast is starting and, and, and heaven is rejoicing. And in some sense that kind of closes this vision. And then another vision opens. Then I saw heaven open. It's, we're, we're kind of still in this final culmination, but now a viewpoint changes. Now it's not a bride, uh, bridegroom coming for his bride, but now we see a warrior emerging. 
So then I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he makes he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So now John receives indeed a new vision. Um, image of lamb is not thrown aside, but it is revealed to be more than meets the eye. The lamb turns out to be a mighty warrior. And this is, uh, you remember when we were speaking about the heavenly worship scene where, where uh, John hears that there is somebody who is worthy, the, the Lion of Judah has conquered and he is worthy to open the scroll, and then he turns and he sees a lamb as if, as if slaughtered. And he, the, we, we spoke there maybe a little emph emphatically about how that's a great, you know, a twisting point when he, you expect something but you get something totally different. Well, it turns out that the lamb was all along a lion also. It is the lion of Judah, uh, the, the great warrior who emerges now. His eyes are like flames. We have already seen this in, in first chapter with Jesus. He has many diadems on his head. Uh, many diadems represents absolute power. The beast and the dragon had seven crowns. Christ has many. And I think this point is here to hint that uh, they are so numerous that they need not or cannot even be counted. There simply is many, much more than seven. His name is a secret. He has a, a name written that no one knows but himself. And here apparently we are pointing to the promise given to Pergamon. The one who conquers will receive a white stone with a name whom no one knows except the one who receives it. Christ is hidden and incomprehensible to the unbelieving world. But to his church, he makes his name known. And what is his name? I mean, this, this chapter actually tells his name. His name is the Word of God, in verse 13. His name is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, in verse 16. So Jesus has a name, and it's, it's revealed here. His name is the Word of God, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. But it says, no one knows it but himself. So I think what John is saying here is that, that the name of Jesus, the nature of Jesus as God's word and truly the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, it is a hidden reality. The, the world does not know his name. It is true, but they do not comprehend it. Except you could say now, now, now it becomes apparent, now it becomes uh, revealed. His robe is dipped in blood, pointing to his sacrificial death. It is through the shedding of his blood that he has received his kingdom. As pointed out already in chapter 6, the Lamb is worthy to open the scroll because he gave his life to purchase a kingdom of priests to his Father. It might also refer to Isaiah 63. Uh, and its description of God's judgment. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath. Their blood spattered my garments and I stained all my clothing. And uh, there it's, it's depiction of judgment but also uh, salvation to God's own people. And it does seem also fitting because uh, then uh, verse 15 speaks of treading the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. So I think we have two visions here. It's all, on the other hand, it's his own blood, which is his purple cloak, his, his robe of honor. But on the other hand, it might also be referring to his task as the one who treads the winepress of God's wrath and gets himself uh, red by doing that. 
sword coming out of the rider's mouth is also an image we previously saw in the first chapter, uh, verse 16. He had a sword coming out of his mouth. Now he actually uses it. He wields it against his enemies. He has a rod of iron. Likewise, we've seen that before. Uh, as a symbol of Christ's messianic power, both in Revelations 2, uh, he is the one who has the rod of iron, and also in 12.5, when the child uh, who was born of the woman is the one who will uh, uh, rule the nations with the rod of iron. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come! Gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. The outcome of the battle is certain even before it begins, so that carrion birds can be called to eat already before it begins. This is, you could say in some sense, this is the unholy supper where the beast and the false prophet and their servants will give their body to be eaten and their blood to be drunk. Old Testament background is in the great battle of Gog and Magog, described in Ezekiel 39. A call out to every kind of bird and all the wild animals. Assemble and come together from all around to the sacrifice I am preparing for you, the great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel. There you will eat flesh and drink blood. So it's the Ezekiel 39, which is, is the background of this sort of saying, uh, or idea of God's coming judgment that he calls the carrion birds to show up because there will be lots to eat uh, when the battle is coming, the war of God and Magog. And then, then the battle commences. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped this image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire and burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. So, the great message, I would say, the great message of this description of the last battle is, you could say, lack of description. Anti-climatic outcome. Now, if you would be doing a Hollywood movie, I, I complain about this all the time. I, I think battle scenes are eating away good storytelling in Hollywood movies, but that's how it is. Uh, if you do a Hollywood movie, you, you, know, you devote one quarter of the movie to the grand final battle, which will, obviously, it will be described in the way that it seems it's, it could go either way to keep it very uh, exciting for the uh, for the viewer, and uh, probably at some point it looks like the good guys are even actually going to lose it, and only by some uh, trick or, or very good luck they manage to defeat their enemies. That's how movies made, are made. This is not at all like that. This has nothing of that. There is no great struggle, no shifting front lines, no strategic maneuvers, no charges and counter charges, no plots and, and tricks how they defeat the enemy. None of that. Everything is over before it can even properly begin. What about the mark of the beast? <coughs> the beast. Well, let's get back to that later. Yes. Okay. Um, before it can even properly begin, the battle is over. And it's, it's showing God's sovereignty in his power. Like, up until now, we've been reading about how this uh, beast and dragon and false prophet have been persecuting the church and they appear so mighty and powerful that no one can resist them. You know that the nations are saying, who is like the beast? Who can fight against him? That's in chapter 13. Everybody is marveling the beast, saying he's so strong that there is no one who can oppose it. And then God shows up. Christ shows up and 
They don't describe even a single blow the beast strikes. He's just taken like a kitten. Well, not kitten because they are nice and cute. But he's, he's grabbed like, you know, he can't do anything. He's taken and, and cast into the lake of fire, and that's the end of it. I, I just find, I've, as a literary thing, I find it interesting how Revelation describes the final battle without describing it. It's kind of like I, you know, it's a rant. You can edit this away, <laughs> maybe later. Um, that's why I didn't like so much the Narnia movie that came out, you know, like ten years ago or so. In in C.S. Lewis's original story, he kind of had that. Sorry, I should be going into this, but I'm going anyways. In Lewis's original story, he has kept some of this idea that when Aslan shows up. The battle ends in one page. You know, it, the, the book is like this, and then there's one page where it basically just says the battle's over. And that's, I think that's awesome. That's a wonderful way for a storyteller to show what disparity of power there actually was between the evil witch and the good liar. In the movie, because movies work that way, they made it all different. And because I'm, you know, I'm older than my years. I'm grumbling about things like that. You know, I think they don't make good movies anymore. And then I say that the Hollywood ruined that by extending the battle scene way too long. Anyhow, I like I like how Revelation describes it, and we see it again in, in chapter twenty. But there we go. Battle is done. God won. Now we go into chapter twenty, and twenty is. Say, if you have questions, hold on to them. Let's, let's go through them at the end. I tried to get through this, so then we have a little bit of time for discussion. Um, chapter 20, probably, and the description of thousand years we have here, is along with the mark of the beast in chapter 13, probably among the most studied chapters of Revelation. This is what tickles people's imagination. And there is what we call Chiliasm, of the Greek term, or millennialism, uh, traditions of interpretation, like uh, traditions of reading this chapter, where uh, an actual 1,000 year long period of peace and spiritual prosperity is expected to arrive before the final judgment of the world takes place. And there's a whole variety of interpretations within this millennial uh, uh, manner of reading. Uh, but for the sake of brevity, the, we can divide them into two rough, uh, roughly into two, pre-millennial and post-millennial. And just, now we'll, I, I think I'll be giving you a little bit of a lecture here about the history of interpretation, but let's, let's allow that. So pre-millennial and post-millennial millennialism are usually the, the main strands. This is the terminology you would encounter in theology books. Post-millennial where Christ returns after, post, after the millennium. This post-millennial view assumes that before Christ's visible return, an earthly, global realm ruled by Christians emerges. In this realm, the gospel and Christian virtue reign. Now, most of today who would have this kind of vision would say that this reign or rule is established without the use of violence. But in the history of the church there has been numerous sects that have incited people and actually made them rise into open rebellion with the purpose of bringing God's kingdom with the force of arms. And once this literal thousand year kingdom then draws to its close, a great period of temptation and unbelief takes place ended then by Christ's final visible return. Then pre-millennial view, where Christ returns pre, like before millennium, assumes that this kind of a blissful reign cannot come to be without God's direct and dramatic intervention. So Christ must first return in full visible glory and establish this rule. It's impossible for the church and Christians to do without his direct uh, uh, involvement. 
this view often holds that Christ's return is accompanied by a resurrection of the believers who then rise up to rule this earthly kingdom together with Jesus. This is the left behind books. Yeah, I guess uh, left behind books would be one variety of this. This view also assumes that at the end of ages, Satan once more leads people astray before the final judgment commences. And I think there is a little bit of a... Yeah, the Left Behind series is a little bit different in the sense that it, it, it assumes that Christ first comes secretly and takes away his own, and then comes the period of tribulation, and after the tribulation, Satan is bound, right? Mm -hmm. And then begins the earthly uh, time of peace. Mm -hmm. And I think there is also a variant where the tribulation happens at the end of the thousand mm -hmm. years, but... Like I said, it's, it's really, there's a lot of varieties, lots of different versions of, of how, uh, how the things relate to each other, at what point Christ comes, and then, um, well, let's talk about that a little bit more later. Then the third view, uh, which could be called, and usually is called, a millennial, literally means denial of millennium, but I think that's not a very accurate word for it, because a millennial view doesn't deny millennium, but it interprets, it interprets the thousand years depicted in Revelation to mean a spiritual rule instead of a political one. A millennial interpretation sees the millennium beginning with Jesus' resurrection and continuing until the church has completed the task of proclaiming the gospel as decreed by God in his plan. This is then followed by a period of persecution when Satan is allowed to attack the church in more intense manner until finally Christ's visible return puts an end to his power. So there are the three views, pre-millennial, post-millennial, and amillennial. In the history of the Christian church, I would say pre- and amillennial views are the only ones that have been common. Post-millennial views the idea that Christians first formed the, uh, the reign of peace on earth uh, on their own, you know, without direct involvement of Christ. Post-millennial views have sprung up here and there, but usually only among short-lived sectarian groups who sought to revolutionize society. I would say about the, the, the post-millennial views, the most notable would be among pietist missionary societies uh, during the late 18th century and then throughout the 19th century, which was characterized by optimism. And, you know, you can't really blame them too much for it. They were filled with missionary zeal, with the idea that uh, now, I guess there was a little bit of uh, European imperialism there as well, but the idea was that the whole world is now open for us to, to missionize, and therefore we send missionaries everywhere and make the whole world Christian. And therefore, a new age for the church is dawning, you know, with, with, with uh, uh, colonial empires expanding the, the worldview greatly and also Christianity spreading, is starting to spread rather quickly. And, and there was, uh, I guess, even if it's not purely a millennial, uh, or sorry, post-millennial ideas, refined, but still, ha the, the, the earliest 20th century still has this sense of optimism, this idea that during our generation we will evangelize the whole world, and the gospel will be taken everywhere. And it's, some commentators then say that, that this is kind of like, this is the high before the crash, that then comes the First World War, followed by the Second World War, and, and the post-millennial uh, is, it's an optimist view, and it doesn't survive very much anymore in the 20th century, because it just doesn't look like uh, the church might bring uh, a whole new era into the world. Um, among earlier theologians of the church, mainly before 300, uh, mainly before the 4th century, uh, pre-millennialist interpretations were somewhat common. I don't know if they were the most common, but they were common. So the idea was that the church that lived under persecution kind of assumed that Christ would show 
in full glory uh, and crush the ones who persecute them and establish uh, an earthly kingdom. However, since the 4th century, uh, a millennial view became more dominant. Following primarily St. Augustine, actually Augustine wasn't the guy who came up with it, it was uh, somebody starting with a T uh, before Augustine, but then Augustine adapted that view as well. Uh, the church began to understand Revelation 20 to describe the spiritual rule the saints would have together with Christ in his church. So that it was not actually speaking about uh, saints ruling on earth would not mean that they have an actual kingdom, you know, with, with ministries and, and, and currency and laws and, and borders and passports and, you know, whatever kingdoms have, but rather it means um, a spiritual rule where, where Christ and his saints rule the spirits and, 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 and faith. Now, why does the change take place there? It doesn't necessarily have to be that. It might just be uh, that the, 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 the exegesis of this became just more convincing. But of course, historically, church enters into a, a very different era in the 300s. That the church which used to be persecuted uh, and, and the final persecutions took place, oh gosh, towards the very end of, uh, of 200s. So not really that much earlier. And then comes the Constantinian turn, where Emperor Constantine, and that's how the story goes, receives a vision and, and becomes a favor, uh, begins to favor Christianity, so that then 311 Christianity is made legal, and very soon after that, it's, it's made the official state religion of Roman Empire. So suddenly, uh, within one generation, the church which began persecuted minority turned into the, the religion of the emperor. Wow, what a turn, from rags to riches. But the thing is that the, at, when this takes place, it seems like the millennium is here. It seems like now we got the Christian empire we kind of hoped we would someday get. But I guess reality is just strike them at that point. They realize that the People are still ignorant and, and mean and, and, and sinful and they, they do bad stuff and they don't go to church as often as they should and, and they are, you know, occupied with mundane things of, of, of I don't know, wine, wine, food and women. And it seems that the earthly kingdom of God didn't come, even though the emperor converted. So I think that's probably a, a, a one of the cause why... Uh, at least you could say why this view becomes much more strong in the church, that it seems the experience he taught them that, uh, that it just didn't work, that the earthly kingdom of God uh, isn't what we thought it might be. The Lutheran church has largely followed the main line of classic Christianity, and by classic Christianity I mean Augustine and basically everybody after him. Um, by holding on to a millennial view. Augsburg Confession condemns uh, what we could call post-millennialism. Augsburg Confession uh, 17 says, they, that is the, the, the Lutheran congregations, condemn also others who are now spreading certain Jewish opinions that before the resurrection of the dead, the godly shall take possession of the kingdom of the world, the ungodly being everywhere suppressed. And probably the Lutheran confessions were also moved by the catastrophe of the German Peasants' War in and, uh, 1524 and 25, which was a bloodbath. Uh, and, and mainly, of course, it's not only about religious reasons, but you can say that the religion gave a spark, a spark to a very dry tinder. So um, there were preachers going around saying that now it is up to us to bring God's visible rule on earth and let's start by killing that stupid landlord there. <laughs> that's, 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 how you, that's how you bring God's kingdom. And, and then mobs, you know, mobs rose up with the pitchforks and, and finally were put down by the, by the princes and awful lot of people died. 
And so when you come to 1530 with Augsburg Confession, it's still very fresh in memory, and, and, and of course they are very uh, strongly against that. It has been sometimes said that the Augsburg Confession, by saying this, does not condemn all kind of millennialism. It only condemns post-millennialism, which uh, tries to bring uh, the power of the kingdom of God on earth through violence. And if somebody instead, like the pietist missionaries, would want to keep the hope that some, somehow God uh, leads things so that the church triumphs <laughs> before the end and there, there comes this wonderful era of, of spiritual flourishing and, and peaceful coexistence, I don't think it's terribly horrible if somebody thinks this. It's, it's nice and hopeful, but perhaps not, uh, perhaps a little bit too optimistic. Um, I would say that the majority of Christian churches still would hold a millennial, a millennial view. But as Daniel already noticed, this premillennial idea that Christ shows himself visibly and, and topples over the kingdoms and, and the governments of this world and establishes an earthly rule with Jerusalem as its capital and, and its, its government um, run by resurrected saints of old. I guess that exists quite strongly in, in some Protestant churches, such as maybe Pentecostals mostly, uh, Charismatics. That would be where this is very popular, especially then, um, <clears throat> um, I can't remember the writers, um, Hayes, Hayes, okay. Anyhow, well, um, I, I, I guess I, I, I'm with the party polity there. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a millennialist in this sense. I think we can discuss that. I'll, I'll give a, a cause or, or arguments for amillennialism, which probably any Lutheran pastor in, in our church could give you uh, if you ask them. Few things, how to argue for um, um, a millennialist view, which says basically that we are now living the millennium. We are now in the midst of the thousand year reign. Um, few points. First, while all scripture is certainly God's word, in formulating doctrines, uh, certain precedents should be given to the Gospels. So that, for example, Revelation supports and deepens the doctrine already established in the four Gospels. Now, when it comes to millennialism, none of the four Gospels has any hint of such a period existing before Christ's second coming. The eschatology of the Gospels, how Jesus speaks in Matthew 24 and 25, for example, or Mark or Luke, the eschatology of the Gospels is instead rather straightforward. This is basically what Jesus says. Gospel will be proclaimed in all the earth. He sends the apostles to take the message. The church will face severe persecution. And then at the end, Jesus visibly returns to judge the living and the dead into eternal joy or eternal misery. Millennium is not found anywhere in the four Gospels or any of the epistles either. Paul doesn't uh, have any notion of, of, of this kind of a earthly reign of, of, of governance. So that's one uh, which not, doesn't you know, like completely establish it. It's, it's simply saying that Jesus didn't say in the Gospels anything about it, but that's not necessarily yet enough. Well, then there is a second point. Scripture passages speak of Christ's kingdom as one which is not a political government. In John 18, he says, My kingdom is not of this world. In Matthew 20, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. So he's uh, putting the earthly governance against what he wants his people to be doing, not using coercion. Uh, then in, in Luke 17, on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor we, will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. 
and of course that's also an interesting question of what does Jesus mean by saying it's in your midst, does it mean uh, I am the kingdom and here I am standing in the midst of you, or does it mean that it's internally inside your hearts? That doesn't actually matter when you think about the interpretation for this question. Jesus simply means that his kingdom is not one you can observe by saying, like, there's Byzantium, there's Rome, uh, here's Judea. It's not that kind of a kingdom. Third point. As long as people are corrupted by the original sin, any earthly government where faith in Christ and holy living rule can only be achieved through oppression and violence. Sinful people will continue to rebel against God's word as long as sin remains in them. In the bodily resurrection it will be taken away, but not before that. It would be impossible to imagine, oh, not impossible, but I would say I find it very hard to imagine, Christ ruling his earthly kingdom like a divine monarch using police and military to force people into holy life. And this may be an argument from <laughs> pessimism, but basically the argument I've been thinking is that we have had, for example in Europe, societies where the monarch wanted all people to live decent lives. And that just doesn't produce the kind of holiness God desires. It, it just tends to produce hypocrisy. And at worst, even in the best scenarios, uh, it, it, it requires, you know, sword and bayonet to, to back it up. So, so uh, it, it would require, you know, some sort of a... Uh, religious police which gives you severe punishment for swearing, for example, and, and, and everything. So as long as we are corrupted in our um, souls and hearts, uh, the only way earthly governance can really be according to God's law is that it must wield the sword in a very, very thorough and powerful way. And that's almost like a, like a divine police state. It's a little bit, maybe, I'm, I'm making a strong case here, but exaggerating so that you get the, get the, uh, get the gist of it. Well, and I experienced the opposite. I experienced personally the opposite of what you just said. Okay. That holiness is enforced with the pain. I observed the opposite. It was also pain. Right, true. You can with a bayonet, you can force all sorts of things. That's I'm just saying it doesn't come naturally to men. Right. Yeah. It doesn't come naturally to, to sinful humans. And the fourth point, uh, maybe a little bit positive in the sense, is that how the any millennialist view would be would be argued for is to say that this kingdom is already taking place, and it's testimony of scripture that this is so. Christians have already been made a kingdom of priests, priests through the blood of Christ, as it's said in the chapter 5. They already rule on earth. We stopped there in, in that, was it third session or when we did we go uh, through that heavenly throne room vision and talked us briefly about what it means that we already rule on earth. That's what, what, what it said there. And so some sort of ruling is taking place. Romans 5 also says, For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man Jesus Christ? Christ and his church do not reign a political realm, but theirs is a kingdom of grace that replaces the rule of sin and death. So how should the chapter 20 be interpreted? Now, of course, we leave, as an instructor, I leave you the right and, and freedom to interpret how you consider it to be right. But I would say chapter 20 seems to recap in a short form the entire history of the world. It is not describing an event that chronologically follows chapter 19, Christ's visible return, but it's again, it's a new vision. It's not something that only after this took place, then this takes place. But rather, it's a, it's a parallel. It's a parallel vision of, of what 
took place in the world and how everything went. Uh, the destruction of Gog and Magog at the end of at the end of twenty is the same battle that already was fought in the end of chapter nineteen, where I would say a telling quote from Ezekiel thirty nine or reference to Ezekiel thirty nine already connected that battle with the downfall of Gog and Magog. So there is a link inside Revelation that these seem to be talking about the same battle. Well, that's maybe not binding interpretation, but hinting there. Well, let's take a look at the, at the text itself in, in 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Binding Satan points to Jesus' own teaching about the strong man who is attacked by an even stronger one who then disarms and binds him, as he speaks in Matthew 12 when the um, Jews had this, uh, accused him of, of being in, in, in league with, with the devil. The language of binding the evil spirit is drawn from the Old Testament apocryphal literature, but also is used in New Testament when speaking about the fate of fallen angels, for example in Jude and 2 Peter 2. And in both cases it's described as an event that has already taken place. It's a reality that the angels are currently in bondage. That's how Jude and Peter both talk about it. It's not something that waits to happen in the future, but rather it is present reality that the angels are there uh, bound. Now then, of course, the question is, is Satan bound? And he seems to be awfully active for one who is bound. It might be hard to believe that he is bound if one expects that to mean that Satan is rendered completely helpless. Binding might here simply mean that Satan is restricted by God's power. He is able to move in a limited sphere but God puts, puts boundaries to everything he is allowed to do. And you could maybe compare him to an angry dog chained to a tree. Unable to roam freely, but anyone going too close will realize that he still has his teeth. So the devil is then captured in the abyss, the bottomless pit, which is the same place where the demons exercised from the men of Gerasa were afraid they would end up in Luke 8 and instead they went into the pigs. And where also the angels, fallen angels, are kept, waiting for their judgment. The abyss is the devil's prison, but with God's permission, he can actually open its door, like described in Revelation 9, in order to release demons to do their work. However, sealing has taken place. Once again, sealing is signifying authority and legal power. When God's angel presses the seal to the entrance of abyss, he shows that the devil in his prison is completely under the power and authority of God. As Luther said, he is God's devil. So, basically, I guess it means that the, the abyss is both the, the, the kingdom and prison of the devil. He is imprisoned there, and he is not able to roam freely, and the seal of God signifies that this, this abyss is belonging to God also, and he rules over it as well. But still, the devil is given limited uh, allowance to open the door of the abyss and bring forth um, his works as it pleases God or his purposes. As Revelation has, I think, shown to us already, Numerical values are usually not meant to be literal amounts. 
we have seven eyes of the lamb, which don't mean that the lamb is some kind of a monster with multiple eyes, but it simply means that he has a full and complete vision. We have 144,000 saved from the tribes of Israel, which again, uh, when we studied that, meant that, that it's the whole number of God's elect, not some uh, arbitrary uh, number of seats in heavenly banquet. Or the, uh, the 42 months of, of church's uh, witness is not like a ticking clock, but that's also signifying a symbolical number. I'm thinking here, in this case, number 1,000 means a great multitude and fullness of that number. When Revelation 20 speaks of 1,000 years, it simply means the complete time God uh, allots for his church before the devil is released. This time period has nothing too much or too little. It is the full amount of years needed for the task of the church is performing. Then we continue. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Revelation describes two resurrections. The first is a spiritual one and takes place already now when people through baptism and faith are made alive in Christ. Jesus said, A time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So the dead will live. That is what resurrection means. So Jesus said that time has now already come that those who hear his voice live. That means faith, eternal life in Jesus. And, and similar, Colossians 2 speaks about baptism, how we were uh, buried and, and raised there. Romans 6 speaks of the same thing. You were put to death through baptism and raised again to life. Uh, so that's there as well. So this is the first resurrection, where the ones who believe are raised from the death of sin into God's mercy and eternal life already now. This resurrection obviously is given only to those who believe. Then the second resurrection comes, and that is the general bodily resurrection described in verse 13. The deaths are also mirroring. First death was the bodily death, after eating the forbidden fruit in Genesis 2, which also included spiritual darkening and death through sin. This death has reigned since Adam, but even that death pales in comparison to the second death revealed in verse 14. But it's actually interesting when you see that what, what, what Revelation here says that the first resurrection uh, means that the second death has no power. And that's showing, well, again, the spiritual nature of the first re resurrection because Christians do bodily die. Bodily Christians die like others. But, so it doesn't say that the first death has no power, because actually the first death does have its limited power that our bodies will stop moving and grow cold one day. But uh, the second death, the eternal death away from God, the spiritual death, um, does not have power over Christians. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number <clears throat> is like the sand of the sea, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophets were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. <coughs> and I would say, as already described in chapter 19, this battle too is pretty anticlimactic. I mean, there is this idea of surrounding the holy city, but still, the focus is how utterly and quickly and without any question, uh, Jesus wins the battle. 
the revelation glorifies Jesus and doesn't dwell on the might of his earthly adversaries. Even the whole might of the unbelieving world and their king, the devil, does not deserve longer description than this. <clears throat> then I saw a white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. Vision of the throne returns. Already in chapter 4 we saw the throne uh, which signified God's power and rule. And it has been mentioned time and again ever since its introduction in the vision. Uh, it pops up throughout Revelation. So the judgment scene which now unfolds takes place in the same throne room or temple where John has already so many times been where the 24 elders, the entire Church of Christ, is already praising God and has been praising God all along. The earth and sky fleeing from God's presence depicts how the creation in its current form passes away on that day. This has already been seen in, in chapter 6 when the last seal was broken uh, and it's also echoing the words of 2 Peter 3 which speaks of the day of the Lord when the heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. I would say the viewpoint here is not one of utter destruction, but rather clearing and making way for the salvation of the Lord. Isaiah 51 <coughs> nicely ties these aspects together. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, look at the earth beneath. The heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants die like flies. But my salvation will last forever. My righteousness will never fail. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. This description of judgment begins like Daniel 7, 10, where it says the court sat in judgment and the books were open. Books can mean both uh, the mode or the, or the manner of judgment as saying like the books, books of law. Or they might be the thing which is judged, which is like the deeds of men, as accounting books, where everything is recorded. Anyhow, anyhow, it means God's judgment is not random or arbitrary, but rather everything takes place by the book, like you say in English. Instead of, uh, uh, yeah, instead of random decisions, everything is recorded carefully. Daniel, however, does not mention one thing in his vision, the book of life. It is, however, mentioned elsewhere in Scripture, both in Psalms and Philippians, as book where the righteous have their names written. In the judgment scene of Revelation, the book of life, which is already mentioned with Sardis and also the fall of Babylon, this book comes to the fore. It's important to note the numbering of books. John says people were judged on the basis of what was found in the books, plural. All those who name, whose name was not in the book, singular, were condemned. So here in Revelation also, we see uh, justification without the works of law. The book of life is not speaking anything about the works of men, only whether one's name is written there or not. All who are not written in the book of life are judged according to their works, and go to hell. Their options are two. A. To be judged according to the books based on your works and end up in the lake of fire. Or B. Be judged on the book of life which does not speak of one's works anymore and then therefore be saved. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death.
the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Death and Hades are the final enemies to be destroyed. Uh, resounding the words from Paul from 1 Corinthians 15. Death, where is thou victory? Verse 13 shows that they are not able to hold on to their possessions. They must give up the dead that were in them. The second death that now comes is the death eternal in the lake of fire, and it befalls on everyone who is not written in the book of life. All right. I think we will take a... Um, we will stop here. And... Um, we will now arrive to the end of, of the judgment scene, and after this... Um,